Hello and welcome to EE Masterclass. The goal of EE Masterclass is to help educate newer or more inexperienced players. In this video we'll be focusing on a more nuanced and complicated subject that really seems to scare away newer players. Logic. While logic is incredibly overwhelming and can be quite complicated, I've found that certain approaches to teaching it can give players insight as to how to solve problems. One of the most important things to understand about logic is that there's no one solution to a problem, and for that reason, most people will be hesitant to share their logic. This isn't due to selfishness, but rather, your specific build is likely going to need a unique set of logical solutions. Asking questions like, how do I make my car move, or how do I make my plane fly, may seem like a good place to start, but those questions sound extremely vague to the average player because the explanation is typically so vast or optional that it would be better if you were more specific. The single most important thing about logic and problem solving in general is doing the little things right. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never do the big things right. To start, I'm going to go over a general layout of how logic operates, and then move on to more commonly used applications to hopefully get you thinking about ways to combine them to solve problems. Logic, as of the making of this video, can be broken up into three categories. Booleans, real numbers, and vectors. These topics are deeply intertwined, so you'll almost never use just one of them. Booleans are true or false statements while real numbers are almost any number you could type into a box and perform math on. Vectors are a far more complicated subject and I plan on explaining them and their uses in a later video. Boolean inputs and outputs are red nodes that can typically be used for AND, OR, or other computer-like operations. If you've ever played Minecraft, it's going to be very similar to Redstone in that the states that they have are typically going to be on and off. Booleans are helpful for identifying conditions of a build, like if a player is sitting down or pressing a button. Using the gates provided by logic can allow them to do more complicated things, like allow a door to be opened from both sides, or make decisions based on sensor outputs. Real numbers are the most commonly used logical operation. They're identified by green nodes. In almost every build with controls, real numbers will be present. Real numbers can tell a motor which speed to operate at, or can be used to calculate more complicated things, like the drag on an airplane. Vectors, as I stated, are a more deep topic that will be discussed in a different video, but largely they're used for physics applications and some control theory. For this reason, they're typically going to be a bit out of reach to the average player, but by the end of EE Masterclass I hope that most of you will come to understand them. The first demonstration I have contains one of the most commonly used logic parts, the numerical switch box. This serves as a way to convert true or false inputs to numbers. It's the most efficient way to operate vehicles or mechanisms that require player input as most player inputs are via keybinds or buttons, which output booleans. To start, let's make a motor spin. Using the parts that I have just proposed, which value of the motor do you think I should change in order to turn it off and on? I'll give you a second to think about it before I reveal the answer. Got it? The solution to this problem is fairly simple. Let's work backwards. In order to turn a motor on and off, which value is changing? You could change the torque of the motor, effectively making it stronger or weaker, but for most applications, adjusting the speed is preferable as it gives finer control over how it operates. Now that we know which value to change, we can use the switch box we talked about earlier. Simply connect the switch box with the logic node on the motor labeled speed. Now we'll need to decide which values we want to switch between. If you think about it in absolute terms, when a motor in real life is off, it has a speed of zero, and when it's on, it has a speed greater than zero. I decided on 10 for my value. An easy way to connect these values to the switch box is via the constant block. However, there is a more part efficient way of doing it that involves using the configure tool and entering the values there instead. Now we need to decide how we are going to switch the numerical switch box between on and off. To keep it simple, I'll be using a button. Buttons can be pressed by any player once a build is activated, though it can bug out sometimes. Once activated, we can see it performs as expected. The acceleration value I've neglected to mention isn't really important here as it's just how fast the motor will get up to speed. Torque is the rotational force of the motor and for today's purposes I'll be setting that value to 10,000. In general, torque should be increased if your motor feels weak, but you don't really need to think about it all that much. Max torque, however, is limited by PvP mode and the size of the motor, so if you're encountering a ceiling the solution may be to scale up your motor. If we want to use a keybind instead, simply add a keybind activator block in place of the button and connect it up to your switch box. In order to edit the button that triggers the part, open the configure tool and click on the keybind block. Here you'll find two options, is hold and the specific keybind used to turn it on. 
The isHold function changes the keybind block to only output true if the keybind entered is held down. Here, I'll set my keybind as R, and I'll enable isHold. Upon activation, holding R turns the motor on, and letting go turns it off. I encourage you to play with these values and settings to learn how everything interacts with each other. The next most common type of control scheme is one that uses a vehicle seat. The vehicle seat uses real numbers, but the way it outputs them is quite unique. Here I use the tools discussed in the first video to construct a simple car. For wheels, I opted for cylinders as they roll quite well. A vehicle seat is placed on top to control it. For starters, let's discuss how the vehicle seat works. A vehicle seat has two outputs, one called throttle and the other called steering. They both use WASD or the arrow keys to operate. The throttle is your forward and backward control. When I press W, the seat will output a 1. If I press S, it will output a negative 1. And if I press nothing at all, it outputs a 0. The astute among you may have already figured out how you can use this to create a car or a variable speed motor. But this is very similar to the switch box seen in our first example, only now we have the option of negative 1. We can't just feed this directly to the motor, however, because one would make our motors super slow. We can correct this with math. The easiest way to make a value larger in this case is the multiplication block. Here we can multiply whatever value we please with the throttle output in order to give us a faster car. I have a simple diagram here to demonstrate this. For demonstration purposes, I also moved the vehicle seat onto the platform, but you'll probably want it on your car. I used the multiplication block in order to multiply my driver's seat throttle by a value of 20. This will be the speed of my car's motors. I also added a few constants for torque and acceleration that I'll drag out to each motor once I'm finished. Now we can activate our build and drive it. Whoops, looks like half of our motors are spinning the wrong way. An easy fix is to swap the two pieces of the offending motors. Like this. It appears I've swapped the wrong motors. Not a big deal, I can easily switch the direction of these motors by adding a negative to the constant I'm multiplying with. Now we have a car that can't really do much but drive forward and backwards, so let's change that. How can we solve the problem of steering? Servos are a spinning part that will turn to a precise angle, so they're a prime candidate for steering our car. We can use the same mechanism for switching directions on our steering as we did for movement, only instead of modifying the speed, we'll modify the angle. We also need to make a few mechanical adjustments to our car. As you can see, I added a servo that would turn the wheels left and right. Now let's configure them. I copy pasted the mechanism that we used for our motors, but instead of using the throttle value of the vehicle seat, I used steering. I also changed our multiplied value to 45 to make it turn left and right farther. And added a speed constant down below, as servos have four parameters. Go ahead and drag the values to the car servos in the same way that they were applied to the motors. Once activated, my car steers in the wrong direction, and a little too aggressively, 
To fix this, just tweak the values according to what you've seen previously. I lowered the speed and I added a negative value to the angle and now it works great. I encourage you to play around with this demonstration to better understand what some of these values do and to help you problem solve in the future. These are two of the most basic control schemes for creations, and they can be applied to almost anything. Most part descriptions are easy enough to understand to enable you to apply these problem solving methods. But just to make our car a little bit more fun, let's play around with thrusters. Thrusters apply forces to things and to push them. I want to give our car a rocket boost, but it's starting to get crowded on my plot, so let's label our logic with text parts. Because we used both outputs on the seat, let's use a keybind block. This time, I'll configure the numerical switch box directly to save parts. Our rocket boost works great, but our car is a bit slippery. Let's increase the friction on the wheels using the configuration tool. Much more responsive. But even with this added friction, our car still slides around at high speed. I want you to think about how we can solve this problem, and one problem solving method that I typically like to use is to ask myself the question, how has this problem been solved previously? whether it be in the game or in real life. Those of you who have taken physics will know that friction is a function of how hard the car is pushing on the ground. We could make the car heavier, but that would also make it slower. Another way to add downforce to this car is by using wings, similar to the ones used on F1 dragsters. While this may seem a bit extreme, it's a small taste of the types of problems you'll encounter when creating builds. Let's add those wing parts. After a bit of tweaking, the car is a lot more controllable at high speed, even if we lost a little bit of speed to the added friction on the motors. There are many more logical problems that can be encountered in this game, so I encourage you to explore those applications. A little bit of optional homework, try using these mechanisms to move pistons. Take a look at some of the starter builds and how they use these little algorithms. The hover car uses a more advanced algorithm that will be discussed at a later date, as does the starter mech. The other builds should be pretty understandable once you understand this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking this video and showing your support. That being said, I hope you learned something today, and I'll see you in the next video.